Come on, give them a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 God bless you. you. May be seated. Amen. What a wonderful spirit of the Lord is in the house in this place here tonight. Amen. I, I don't know about you, but uh, that that brought great hope to me tonight. Great brought great confidence that what you are doing right now is not in vain. What you are doing right now may feel like you're just treading. Your tires are just going in, in place. You never know the impact that you are making in this moment. Five years down the line, a young lady will call the church and talk about what you did for them, what this church did for them. So keep on keeping on. Every ministry, every leader, every person in this church, keep on keeping on the good fight of faith. God is in control. God is on the throne. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you to the praise team. Wonderful job uh, here tonight as well. We are so honored, and I, I do not say that lightly. We are very honored tonight to have missionary and sister Shalm in our congregation. We are so honored. They have been missionaries. I asked Brother Shalom tonight, how long have you been missionary? He said, 43 years they have been missionaries overseas. Much of that time in Pakistan and other places as well. I'm sure they'll talk about that. And I know they have exciting things that they're going to talk about, what they're going to be doing in the future. But I want to say personally for myself from senior pastor that thank you for giving in this church thank you we have been able to sponsor brother and sister Sean for many many years I don't know how many but it's been many many years that every month this church sends money to help missionary Shalms and we will continue to sponsor them we will continue to do that until until the Lord tells them to stop and <laughs> And then we'll sponsor another missionary. <laughs> but thank you. I know we sponsor, I think, 23, 24 missionaries every single month here at Firstborn. And I'm so thankful that you have given to be able to do that. And we are seeing results because of your giving to the global missions. We are seeing results right here in Rockford, the greater Rockford land area. Amen. Amen. So we want to get out of the way, and we want Brother and Sister Shalom to come at this time and minister. God bless missionary and Sister Shalom. Can we stand to honor them here tonight? God bless them as they come. Thank you, Pastor Maynard. Let's give that praise to the Lord here tonight, would you? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. It's a privilege to be here tonight, to feel the wonderful presence of the Lord, know that he is in the midst of his people. Praise God. Sister Shalom and I travel all the time. Right now we're on deputation and uh, in a different place, it seems like every day almost. And then when we uh, go overseas, we travel then almost every day. And so uh, you're facing new cultures, new languages, new food, new weather, everything changes, but one thing is constant, and that's the presence of the Lord. Yes. Praise God. And I'm thankful for His presence that here's, that's here tonight because that makes me feel at home. Praise God. Praise God. You may be seated. It is a privilege to be here, and I want to thank you right off the top for your support uh, of us for many years. I did some calculating a few years ago at the height of our revival for every $50 partner in mission uh, over a four-year period, that particular partner helped bring in 240 people in Pakistan into the church. 
Praise God. And so uh, that's a, I think that's a, a good investment. Praise God. Jesus said one soul is worth more than the whole world. And so we're thankful for your support. We do appreciate it very much. And we do ask that you remember us in prayer also. Uh, I usually tell this story a little later, but I'm going to tell it now. Uh, we appreciate your prayers. Uh, that makes a major difference for us overseas, and I don't say that lightly, because we have faced many situations living in Pakistan 30 years, later on in Malaysia for, for 10 years, but uh, we have faced terrorism, we have faced uh, earthquakes where 80-some thousand people died, we've faced a lot of other situations, and we know that the prayers of God's people have helped to keep us. Praise God. Four times we were evacuated. And uh, so the Lord has been good to us. But uh, several years ago, we had invited a guest speaker to come and preach a conference in the city of Lahore. That's in the middle of the country. And uh, at that time, Sister Shaw and I were living in Islamabad, the capital, which is in the north. Uh, our guest was flying into the country into Karachi, which is in the south, and so I flew down to meet him. Because most international flights come in the middle of the night, um, I got a hotel, rested for a few hours, drove out to the airport to meet him, and then we drove back to the hotel for a couple of more hours of rest before returning to the airport to fly to Lahore. As we were returning to the airport, I noticed that there were um, armored personnel carriers, tanks, uh, everywhere. At the main intersections there were big sandbag areas with soldiers uh, pointing machine guns out of there and and I said to our guest, I don't know what's happened here but obviously something has taken place. Uh, I hope we can make it to the airport. Well, we were able to make it to the airport, flew to the city of Lahore. When I got out of the plane, uh, I called Sister Sham and let her know we had arrived safely. She said, did you hear what happened in Karachi this morning? And I said, no, I saw that there was a lot of military around, but I didn't really know what happened. She said, well, at 8 o'clock this morning on the airport road, uh, a van carrying some American diplomats was on its way to uh, the consulate, and uh, they were attacked by terrorists and killed. And I was shocked because... My friend and I had got passed that spot five minutes earlier, which means that the terrorists were already there, and we could have been mistaken uh, for the, who they were uh, targeting. And uh, so we had the convention and conference in the city of Lahore. I flew back to Islamabad, and a few days later, Brother David Hudson, a pastor in Morgantown, West Virginia, called me. He said, Brother Sham, is there some kind of a problem in your family. And I said, not that I'm aware of, why? He said, well, several days ago, he said, we were having a ladies conference, a district ladies conference in our church. There were over 400 ladies gathered together. And uh, I was there as the host pastor, but he said, in the middle of the service, the Lord spoke to me to uh, interrupt the service and have that congregation pray for you. And uh, so I said, well, when was it? And he said, they actually prayed for two hours. Uh, the 400 ladies there were praying for two hours. And so I asked him, well, when was it? We lined up the date. And then because Pakistan is uh, probably 10 hours ahead of here, um, we aligned the hours, figured out when it was. The two hours that I drove to the airport to pick up our guest and drove back to the hotel with the two hours that they were praying for us. <laughs> Praise God. And uh, you say, well, why did the, the Lord allow the diplomats to be shot? I don't know. Maybe somebody was supposed to pray for them and they didn't listen. But I believe it makes a difference and we want to thank you for praying for their missionaries. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. I'm going to ask Sister Sean to come at this time and to share a few things with you. Praise God. 
Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Thank you for having church on Sunday night. <laughs> it's good to be in church. Amen. I love the presence of the Lord, and I like to be with God's family. Amen. So this is a real pleasure for us to be with all of you. And I am very thankful tonight that I'm a missionary. Thankful that the Lord complimented us by calling us and asking us to do something a little bit out of the ordinary for him. Asks us to go somewhere that you know, it's not really destination of choice for most people. <laughs> and apparently he wanted to do something there and he needed somebody to work through. And uh, we got picked. And it's, it's been a great honor and a great privilege for us. And we are very, very thankful for what God has done and what he's continuing to do. It's been mentioned that we've been, is that echoing a little bit? Um, 43 years. And uh, we've got a lot of stories to tell. People always say, oh, I love missionary stories. I could listen all night. But if you start talking, they're like... <clears throat> <laughs> so I decided to write a book and my book is called Alan Was Away that's Alan behind me and uh, this is a missionary story a little different from most missionary books that you'll read it's written from my perspective as a wife and a mom uh, raising our family in Pakistan and a lot of the amazing things that God did in our personally for us in our family and things that happened to our kids and all kinds of stuff and then woven through all of that our stories of our work our bible school and lead up to the crusades that we had and a lot of different things and um, people say that it's it's pretty entertaining they've enjoyed it so if you would like to get yourself a copy i'll be in the foyer after church they're twenty dollars and you can pay cash you can write a check or you won't you're not going to believe how technologically advanced we are we actually have a little gadget that I can run a credit card it's amazing 72 years old but don't give up on us yet <laughs> amen something else that I want to mention to you we have a project and uh, our project is airfare and that's because in this next four years, our next four-year term, we are not going to be stationed in one country. Our ministry is changing, and we're going to be traveling. Our focus will be on Asia and the Pacific regions, but actually we, we can go anywhere we get invited. And actually in 2023, after we finish School of Missions in May, between the end of May and November, we're going to be in five of the seven regions that Global Missions has divided the world into. We're going to be in five of those regions just this year. So um, that's pretty cool, really. And we kind of live in a state of, of uh, nonstop jet lag. Uh, but it, that's okay. We can do it. And so um, airfare is not cheap. And the only other thing that we can do is travel for another year to raise enough money to pay for all of those flights. And so what we've done, I've got a little basket on the back table, and we're giving you an opportunity to help us with our airfare. The uh, logo of the United Pentecostal Church, anybody know it off by heart? The whole gospel to the whole world. And um, most of you, you have families, you have jobs, you have a mortgage to pay. You have all these things going on, so you're not really free to go all around the world preaching the gospel, but we are. That's what we're doing. And so we invite you to go along with us by dropping something in the basket. Your church will get missionary credit for whatever goes into the basket, and you can help send the gospel to the whole world. And our hearts will be very, very grateful for everything that you do. Let me say again, thank you for letting us be here tonight. It, it's always, um, 
I don't know, I say it lots of times, but it's just so refreshing to go all different parts of the country. We're all over the place. We've been in Alabama, we've been in Arkansas, we've been all kinds of places. And you walk into the building and you start shaking hands with people and you're like, wow, this is our family. These people are the same as we are. They love the Lord just like we do. They believe the same things we believe. And so it's, it's wonderful for us to be here tonight. Thank you for blessing us, and thank you for letting us bless you. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Just to give, us a, give a little background of our situation, uh, I was born and raised in India. My parents went as missionaries in 1949. And so uh, we've been involved in missions for a few years. Uh, I went home to Bible college in 1970, met Sister Shaum, and we felt like the Lord had directed us to continue our lives together. We pastored in Toronto, Canada for about seven and a half years and then uh, moved overseas. We tried to go to India, but the government there wasn't allowing mission, new missionaries to come in, and so we uh, moved to Pakistan instead, which used to be a part of India. And, uh, well, as they say, the rest is history. In the uh, 30 years that we were there, we saw the church grow from 12,000 believers to 160,000 believers. Uh, we, uh, well, I, I became the superintendent in 1994. We left in 2012, so that's 18 years if my math is correct. And in that time, we saw 55,000 people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, 32,000 people baptized in the name of Jesus. And so we're just thankful for what the Lord has done in that nation, and I believe he's got some great things uh, ahead. We're leaving to go there on Friday. We're, their general conference is uh, uh, coming up in the city of Lahore, and so we're gonna be going there and uh, are looking forward to that. Praise God. Well, I would like you to stand with me this evening, if you would. We're going to uh, turn in our Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, and I'm going to read verses 1 and 2 and also in verse 6. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, and also reading in verse 6. Uh, if I kind of stumble a little bit here tonight, uh, I'll ask you to pardon me. Uh, I've been in more services this week than we did in two years during COVID in <laughs> Malaysia. <laughs> I was in St. Louis uh, uh, for a conference there and then uh, came up here and uh, we had a service this morning in Addison or this, it started at noon actually. So uh, we rushed to get here. But uh, I do feel something in my heart from the Word of God. We're going to turn and read in, in Luke chapter 9 and verse 1. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Verse 6, and they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence here tonight. We thank you for the uh, anointing of your spirit that is in this place. Now we're asking that that anointing would flow freely, that you would minister to the hearts and lives of each one of us, challenge and inspire our faith to believe you for great and mighty things in the kingdom of God. And we ask these things now in the name which is above every name. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's give him some praise here tonight. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. You may be seated. As I mentioned earlier, I was born and raised in India. And uh, in the Hindu religion, they have men called gurus that uh, are holy men, I guess. They, they would consider them to be holy men. And they travel with a group of 
disciples from town to town to uh, uh, explain their particular philosophy of life, their particular doctrine. And as they go with their disciples, they will be talking to them about the principles of their uh, understanding of the religion and what people are supposed to do. And uh, when they arrive in a new town, they'll find a tree to sit under or go to a shrine somewhere. People will come to hear them teach and to be blessed by them. And so this is something that is very common in that part of the world. I see the same thing taking place here as Jesus gathers together his uh, 12 disciples. We know from John chapter uh, 6, I believe it is, that he had many other disciples. And when he started teaching something that was a little bit rough for them, a lot of them turned and went back. But this was his core group that he was talking to now. Uh, he had probably been doing ministry maybe 10 or 12 months. And so they had walked with him every day. Wherever Jesus went, they went. They would listen to him as they would travel together. He would expound to them about the kingdom of God. He would, he would explain that I have come to the earth to uh, bring God's kingdom and to remove Satan's kingdom. And I said the prince of this world is going to be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. He was talking about how that his kingdom would uh, replace the kingdom of Satan. That where there was sin, he would bring salvation. Where there was sickness, he would bring healing. Where there was destruction, he would bring de deliverance. And so this is what they were listening. They were catching his spiritual DNA as they would walk from town to town. And then when he would arrive there, he would begin teaching or they would be uh, gathered maybe on a hillside sometime and he would expound the gospel of the kingdom to different people and then start to do miracles. So after these 10 or 12 uh, months, the disciples had seen and heard Jesus teaching and preaching. They had seen the miracles that he had done and he said, now I want you to go out and practice what I've been teaching and showing you. And so he called them together. He said, I'm giving you power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. Now, sometimes we just kind of run the words power and authority together, but I think there is some difference. The word power means you have the ability or capability of doing something, but uh, authority means you have the permission or the ability to enact that particular uh, thing. And so it's like a, a weightlifter at the Olympics. He may have the power to lift those weights, but if he does it out of turn, he will be disqualified because the referee didn't give him authority to do it right then. So there's a little difference between power and authority. But Jesus said, I'm going to give you both. And it will be over all devils. We have traveled to many countries. We've ministered in 37 different nations. Uh, traveled to 51 countries all told. But uh, I've been in places where they thought the devil there was stronger than in other areas. Well, even that, if that is the case, Jesus said, I will give you power and authority over all devils. So even if they're stronger, you still have power and authority over them. And then he said to cure diseases. And so then he sent them off and they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. When I was a young person in Bible college, my second year of Bible college, I was studying in Canada. And uh, my father was the general superintendent of the church in India. He was getting ready to nationalize the church. That means turning it over to national leaders. Missionaries had been in charge up to that point. But he was turning it over to them. And so I wanted to go back and to see the process, how it was done. That did turn out to be helpful because I uh, actually was the one that nationalized the church in Pakistan. And then we moved to Malaysia, spent 10 years there. And last August, there, that church was also nationalized. So we were able to help in that process. And so uh, we find that, uh, or when I, when I was in my second year, rather, I, I went to India. I took a friend with me from the Bible school. And uh, we were there for three months. 
But uh, during that time, Brother Billy Cole, a well-known evangelist, many of you have heard of him, uh, came uh, to India and spent three weeks there. And we got to travel with him as he preached in different towns and villages. And this was pre-Ethiopia days when he saw uh, thousands and thousands receive the Holy Ghost. But even then, he was a man mightily used of God. And in the three weeks that we traveled with him, approximately 300 people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. At the end of those three weeks, uh, he was getting ready to leave. So he called my friend and I together and he said, I want you boys now to go out and do what you have been seeing and watching me do. What you've heard me teach, I want you to go and put it into practice. In a sense, he was our guru, if you want to put it that way. <laughs> And uh, so we went out. I was naive enough not to know that you were supposed to uh, make it really difficult and, and, you know, have people pray for months to get the Holy Ghost and all that kind of stuff. We just started preaching and believing that God was going to do it. And in, in five services, we saw 156 people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That was very impacting on my life as a young person. It let me know that it didn't matter where you were in the world, that if you would preach the gospel, people will receive it and their lives can be changed. Praise God. It became a driving force in my life. And as I mentioned, we've seen tens of thousands of people now receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But it really started back then as I was traveling with Brother Cole. And when he put that into us, it became a part of us. Well, uh, I believe today that the Lord is calling out people to uh, walk with him so that he can move through them by his power and spirit. In the book of John chapter 15, this chapter talks about, uh, well, it's Jesus actually talking about him being the vine and we are the branches. He said, if you remain in me, you can produce fruit. If you don't, you're going to uh, be cut off and thrown into the fire. But in verse 7, and I would like you to notice this verse particularly, he said, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. He said, if you abide or live in me, not visit once in a while, but if you live in me, and my words live in you. They're not just dead words in you. They're actually live. They live. Then you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Uh, Sister Shalom and I, as I mentioned, travel all over the place, different places every night. And uh, so I have learned uh, one of the first things to do after dropping my suitcases are to look where the light switch is, and the furniture. Because at night time when I'm making a nocturnal visit to the restroom, I don't want to be banging my shins or head somewhere. And so I've got to figure out where everything is placed. But when I'm at home, I don't have to worry about that. We have a basement in our home. I can go down the stairs in the night with the lights out. It doesn't matter where I move around in the house. I know where things are because I live there. And when you live in him, it makes a difference. You know where the furniture is. You know where the light switch is. You know where everything is that you need. It's there. And so as we uh, follow after him and as we live in him, then his words start to live in us. Because when you're living in him, and how do you do that? Well, you study the word of God and you meditate upon it. You don't just read through the Bible as quickly as you can, but you meditate on it. Let it become a part of you. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. This is what uh, the psalmist said. And so we allow that to become a part of us. We pray every day. We're in communion with the Lord. If you're living in something, that means you're there all the time. And so uh, we live in him. And when we live in him, then his words live in us. And I believe it's possible for us as believers today to live in the anointing. You see, Jesus' disciples walked with the Messiah or the Christ who was 
the anointed one, which means uh, he was the Christ, the anointed one. So when they were walking with him, they were walking with the anointed one. But today we don't just walk with him, we walk in him. His anointing is in us, praise God. And so wherever we go, his anointing will be with us. And we can see things happen. We will begin to talk to people. When you live in a home, people that are in the same family start to talk about the same things. They're, they, they use the same phrases. Have you ever heard a three-year-old say something very profound? And you wondered, whoa, where did that come from? Well, it's probably because they heard mom or dad talking about it. And they may not know the full meaning of what it is, but they kind of got the context and they know how to put it there. And I believe when we walk in, or live in him and we walk in the anointing, then his words are going to be in us. And we're going to start talking and speaking them without even thinking. You may just be talking to a friend and not knowing fully their situation. You will say something in the course of your conversation that's going to change their life because there was an anointing upon it. You didn't even know it. But you're just talking and, and you're talking what your father would say, your heavenly father, because you're living in him. And now his words are living in you and you're speaking forth those words and they're bringing about a result. Praise God. Sometimes people seem to think that the anointing is all goosebumps and woo-hoo kind of thing, you know, or floating around up here somewhere. No, it's not that at all. It's just living in him every day. And you're going about your, your duties and suddenly you need to see a miracle. And so the Holy Ghost enables you. Now, I don't know the first person that came in here tonight. I'm assuming the place was basically dark, but somebody turned on the switch. Did that mean there was no electricity before the switch went on? No, the electricity was there. But until you needed it, it remained dormant. But the moment you flick the switch, it comes on. And when we have a need in our life, and when we meet somebody with a need, that's when you flick the switch. Praise God. Well, what's the switch? I believe it's the name of Jesus. Praise God. We say in Jesus' name. And the Lord does a miracle for us because we're walking in the anointing. His spirit is upon us. And when we need it, we don't have to go looking for him. Well, where is he? Where am I in this room? Where's the switch? But you know exactly where he is because you're living in him. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Sister Shom uh, worked at the American International School for a while, and uh, but our kids attend. That was because our uh, kids attended there. She got permission to work there to help pay for their education. But we were at the school, um, or rather at the American Embassy one day. I went with my son to play some some softball. Usually during the week. I would be out at conferences or preaching in different places, but I tried to come home on the weekend to spend some time with my family, and we could attend the local church there. But uh, so sometimes on, on the weekends, I would be out playing softball. Now, at the embassy, they only had one field, so uh, if you weren't playing right now, but your game was next, you would come and start warming up. And so I was warming up, tossing a softball back and forth. And uh, while we were doing that, one of the teachers at the school uh, had an epileptic uh, seizure and swallowed his tongue. And uh, he fell to the ground and was thrashing around trying to get his breath. They stopped the game. People quickly gathered around. There was a physical education teacher there. He was trying to administer uh, uh, <clears throat> first aid and get the tongue out, but it didn't seem to be working. Well, this teacher knew that Sister Shaw and I were missionaries, and he uh, didn't look at anyone else in the circle that was around him, but his eyes fastened on mine as though he was saying, please pray for me. By nature, I'm an introvert. I don't like to make a scene about anything, but uh, I felt in the Holy Ghost to pray. And so I leaned over that physical education teacher, reached over and touched the man on the head, and I said, in the name of Jesus... Instantly, his tongue came out. Hallelujah. 
Sister Sean was at the school several days later and met, met the teacher, and he said, I know who did it and what happened. You see, there is power in the anointing. We think we have to be at general conference or because of the times or Sunday morning service before God's going to do something. But if you read in the Bible, most miracles actually happened outside of the synagogue and the temple. There were a few of them that happened there, but most of the miracles happened in daily life. That's where troubles and problems come. And so if you're going to meet the need, you need to be walking in the anointing. Praise God. Praise God. Wherever we are, we need to be in that anointing. In the book of Acts chapter 5, this is the chapter where Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Ghost about their giving, and as a result, they fell dead, had been carried out and buried. And it tells us in verse 11, And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. That was a part of the temple, the largest area where they could gather. And uh, of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. Notice in verse 15, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets, and led, lay, uh, laid them on beds and couches. Now, as I mentioned, we're going to Pakistan in a few days. We were there in October for two and a half weeks, and we went to preach in a number of churches, including in some areas that they call bastis, which are like barrios in South America. And uh, the streets are very narrow, narrower than it is from the front row to the, to the platform here. And... Uh, Small vehicles are trying to make their way through, little motorbikes. There's vegetable carts. There's all kinds of people, donkey carts going through. And it's crowded and congested. And so I can see the picture in my mind as these people hear that Peter's coming down their street and so quickly they get their sick uncle, whoever it is on that, that's sick in the home, and they put him on a bed and, and they, they pull him out to the street so they can lay him there so that when Peter passes by, maybe he'll pray for them. But the Bible says at the end of this verse, verse 15, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. In other words, the anointing was on Peter to the extent that as he walked by, his shadow just falling on them would touch them. And they would be healed. I believe that's the anointing. And when we live in the anointing, we can impact people. They can feel something as we walk by. Praise God. If we're filled with the Holy Ghost, we can make an impact upon the earth, upon people in this world. I remember reading about Azusa Street. That's in Los Angeles in the early 1900s when the Pentecostal experience was first outpoured in recent days. And... Uh, as they uh, were gathered together, it was an, a stable on Azusa Street. People would be praying day and night continuously. Every once in a while, somebody would get up and give an anointed word from the Lord, but for the most part, they were praying. And they tell us that there were people who would be passing by a block away, uh, going about their regular business, maybe to a business meeting or whatever it was they were doing. And as they were just walking along innocently, it felt like there was a magnet that pulled and drew them into that building. And as they came in, they would fall on their faces and begin to call out to, to the Lord. I believe that the Holy Ghost still is for the church today. And we need to walk in the anointing. We need to walk in the power of God. I think we get involved with so many other things that we don't really live in Him the way that we need to. But I believe as we do that and as we walk in the anointing, we're going to have an impact around those, uh, uh, on those that are around us. The Holy Ghost will be in our lives and they're going to feel that Holy Ghost flow. Praise God. Praise God. When we first went to Pakistan, we lived in the city of Karachi. Two of our children were born there, uh, including our son. Uh, he's now... 40 years old, but at the time he was about a year old. And at the time of this particular 
story. Uh, it was a holiday in Pakistan. I had, and uh, because of that, I had gone to preach in another place. Whenever they have a holiday there, they have special church services. So I had been invited, and I took the, our vehicle. I was gone. Uh, most Pakistanis, especially in those days, did not have their own transportation. So they relied on public transportation. If they were going to have a picnic, they would rent a taxi and take it. Or if there was a big group, maybe a bus. So almost all the public transport had been already taken care of and, and there were, was nothing available. And so Sister Sham had remained at home uh, with our children. They were quite small at the time. And Jordan, our son, was only about a, a year old, as I mentioned. So uh, she was working upstairs, but she had asked a man that was working for us, his name was William, to keep an eye on Jordan while he worked. And he was actually washing our floor with a very strong poison called phenyl. And it kills cockroaches and ants and all the other things that you don't invite in your home. And so uh, he was supposed to be doing that. Sister Sean was upstairs working. As she was working... She felt that the Lord spoke to her and said, get up and go downstairs right now. And so she got up from her, her desk, started down the stairs. As she came around the corner, it was two, two levels there. Uh, as she came around the corner, she could see that William was not there. He had evidently stepped out for a few minutes. And Jordan was sitting on the steps, just kind of swaying back and forth like this. His eyes were rolled back in his head. And uh, she rushed down the stairs and picked him up. She could immediately smell the phenyl on his breath. He had actually swallowed it. And so uh, she lifted him up and she said, Lord, you know that Alan's gone, that all of the public transport is occupied today. There is no way that I can get to a doctor. But you did in the Bible turn water into wine. And so now I'm asking you to turn phenyl into water in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Jordan began to shake. His eyes normalized. And he never had any side effects whatsoever. God completely touched him. Praise God. Praise God. I'm talking about walking in the anointing. When you need the anointing, you flick the switch, which is the name of Jesus. You're going to see the Lord's power touch and minister uh, according to the need at that particular time. After a couple of years of being in Islamabad, when our kids were in high school, Sister Sham was working in the elementary office um, in, uh, in the school there. She was the administrative assistant. And... Uh, over time, people came to re realize that she was a missionary. And even though many of the teachers were either agnostic, atheists, or uh, studying Buddhism, different Eastern religions, uh, not very many were actually evangelical of any kind. Uh, but they started coming to her when they had a need. If their mother was sick in America... They would come and say quietly to her, Georgine, would you please pray for my mother? This is the situation. So after a while, her office became known as the prayer room. And uh, whenever people needed prayer, that's where they would go. Well, she was sitting in her office one day, and the door opened, and a teacher walked in. This particular lady was a Pakistani teacher. Uh, because the school had more than 50 nationalities in it, uh, they wanted the students to learn a little bit about the culture and geography of Pakistan, and so they had hired this lady to teach it. Uh, she was the wife of one of the nine Supreme Court justices in Pakistan. They were a very influential people. And so she walked in on this particular day, and uh, she came in and said, Georgine, I'm letting you know that I have to leave school early today. Because as you know, my grandson who was born three weeks ago has no immune system. The hospital has just called us and told us he's probably not going to make it through the night. And so uh, you need to come and prepare for his burial. As she was going out the door, she turned back and she said, Would you ask Alan to pray? Now, this lady was not a Christian. She did not believe that Jesus was God. She believed that he was a prophet. But in a time of need... She realized that we knew how to pray. And so she asked for, for that prayer. Sister Sham said, well, you want him to go to the hospital. She said, uh, you mean he'd do that? 
She just thought I'd pray a snatch prayer somewhere, I guess. But uh, uh, anyway, that evening, Sister Shaw and I went to the hospital. The culture of Pakistan is such that if a newborn looks like it's going to die, the family distances itself from them because they don't want to become emotionally attached. So when we arrived at the hospital, no family members were there at all, even though the baby was on the point of death. It was in an uh, oxygen tent, uh, obviously struggling, and uh, I got permission from the head nurse to go into the uh, <coughs> a room there, and uh, I just placed my hand on the side of the bed, on the railing. I said, Lord, you know that this family doesn't believe that you're God. You know that if things don't go well, that uh, it could be very difficult for us. We may be removed from the country because of their influence. But I'm asking you to show forth your power and do a miracle in Jesus' name. We went home. And it wasn't a fantastic prayer. I've seen a lot more energetic ones than that. But when you're, when you're in a hospital, in the emergency room, you don't do, you don't, uh, do that. And so intensive care unit, uh, you have to be a little more careful, I guess. But that doesn't diminish the anointing. And uh, the next day, Sister Sham was in her office. And it must have been coffee break. She had a coffee maker there. And... Uh, Several teachers were standing around drinking coffee on their break. The door opened and this Pakistani teacher walked in. And when she walked in, she said, ladies and gentlemen, I have an announcement to make. Now, she didn't know Pentecostal jargon or language. Uh, so she said it in her way. She said, Georgine and Alan Shaw are holy people. What she simply meant was that we knew how to pray and touch God. She said, I was supposed to bury my grandson this morning, but early in the morning, the doctor called and said, we don't know what's happened overnight, but his immune system has kicked in. Praise God. And so you can come and get him. Praise God. Nine years later, I was at the school, and they were having International Day, so they had it in an open courtyard and different booths set up. And every nationality there had a booth with literature about their country, different things that they were selling uh, from their country, and so on. And uh, because I'm Canadian, and there weren't a whole lot of Canadians there, they asked me to help man the Canadian booth. And I guess I was selling uh, maple syrup or some <laughs> such thing. And uh, Americans were selling hot dogs and hamburgers. <laughs> but... Uh, <clears throat> Anyway, I was standing there selling that stuff and telling people a little about Canada. Uh, I wasn't real busy, but uh, anyway, this lady happened to pass by, and when she saw me, she said, uh, Alan, will you uh, just wait here for a few minutes? She said, I didn't realize you were here. I said, sure, I'm here for the day, so uh, I'll be here. So she went off, came back about 10 minutes later with a young boy. She turned to him, and she said, Junaid, do you remember we told you that when you were a baby that you had no immune system and you were supposed to die, but a missionary prayed for you and you were healed? He said, yes, I, I remember you telling me that. She said, I'd like you to meet him. Nine years later, he has since graduated from high school and from university. He has migrated to Canada. His mother made the statement not long ago, if I ever become a Christian, I want to become a Christian like Georgine. She knows lots of Christians. But you see, there's a difference when you walk in the anointing. When you live in the power of God. And I'm so thankful today that God enables each one of us if we will live in Him and His words will live in us that we can see the power of God in action. We can have the expectation that God will do the miraculous. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I'd like to close with one more portion of Scripture, the book of Mark, chapter 16. I read to you in Luke 9 at the beginning how Jesus sent uh, his 12 disciples out on a field trip to put into practice what they had been seeing him teach and do. But now it's the end of his earthly journey. He's getting ready to ascend into heaven. And in essence, he's telling them, 
that, uh, okay, the field trip is done, but now you're graduating. And I'm going to send you out, and I want you to go, he said in verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So you have to believe and be baptized to be saved. Jesus said that. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs could possibly follow them that believe. No, it says these signs shall follow them that believe. Believers don't follow signs. Just because there's a healer in the next town doesn't mean you go follow him. Signs follow believers. When you're walking in the anointing, the signs will follow you. Praise God. And he said, uh, in my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Okay, so believers are going to speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. My son drank poison, but it did not hurt him. The Apostle Paul had a snake uh, fastened to, to him when he was in Crete. And uh, he just shook it off into the fire. People expected him to die. But when he didn't, then they realized that this was more than a natural thing. They, under, they thought he was a god and they fell down to worship him. And he said, no, no, no. We serve another kind of god. One that is able to do this. And I believe today that the Lord wants us to walk in his anointing so that his power can work through us. That we can reach our world. We can impact our generation. Those around us, we can see the miraculous happen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he said, uh, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So that after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God, speaking of the power of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with him. In Luke, they had gone to a few towns and places, but here it says, now they went everywhere. And the Lord was working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Praise God. I say without any boastfulness at all tonight that as I'm walking here on the platform, the anointing is here because I'm here. Because see, His Spirit is in me. His anointing is in me. And that's what is supposed to happen. But as I move around and then I come down to join you, His anointing comes down here. Because wherever we are, that's where the anointing of God is. Praise God. Well, it's not only in me tonight. It's in your pastor. It's in your bishop. It's in, in their wives. And it's in each of you that has the Holy Ghost. God didn't intend for the church to be five or six people running everything. He intended for the church to be completely involved in the kingdom of God. He said there was a five-fold ministry, and that ministry was to teach people how to do ministry so that the church could be built up and grow. Praise God. And the way it's going to happen is when you go out there in your regular life, you will be at places your pastor will never go. You will be in situations that your bishop will never uh, see, perhaps. And you're going to find there's a need there. And if you will believe the Lord and you believe that the anointing is in you, you can pray for somebody and they're going to be healed. You can pray for somebody to receive the of the Holy Ghost. God has given you the power and the authority. He has placed the anointing in you. And wherever you go, wherever you walk in the anointing, that means that's where God's power is. And you can see it manifested. You can see the miraculous. Our brother was preaching about the, or praying about the supernatural before the service. I heard him say it several times. I believe the Lord can do the supernatural here tonight. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. We are living in a day and age where the world has gone absolutely crazy. What 
used to be up is down and what's down is up and good is called evil and evil is called good and and it's crazy stuff that I can't couldn't even, I read in I checked it up in Google a couple of years ago they said there are now 100 genders when I was a kid there were only two they've multiplied I mean all kinds of strange things are happening in the world today But I believe that the Lord is raising up a church that's going to be pushing back against the darkness and it's going to be through the anointing. We're going to see people's lives changed. You have power. You have power to see the Lord do something. God has placed His Spirit in you. And wherever you go, whether it's into a prison, brother, whether it's to anywhere else, where you go, the power of God goes with you. We had a Hindu convert. He was a priest, a Hindu priest in Malaysia. And he was so dissatisfied with his life, he started walking out in the sea to drown himself. And finally, just before the waves were going over his head, he said, if there is a real God, because the Hindus have 33 million of them, but he said, if there is a real God... I want you to show yourself. And the Lord spoke to him and said, I am here. And he went back. He start, went into another church, but eventually came into one of our churches. And the Lord began to work through him mightily. Just recently, he started a new church in the city of uh, Penang in, or Georgetown in, in uh, uh, Malaysia. And he got permission, somehow got favor with the Hindu uh, person who's in charge of the prison, large prison there. He went in there, and in the last couple of years, over 400 people have received the Holy Ghost in that prison. <laughs> Praise God. He said, I didn't even know what to do when I went in there. So I turned my head, uh, my back to the men and was just leaning up against the wall and praying and saying, Lord, fill them with the Holy Ghost. I don't know what to do. You need to do something. And he said, when I turned around, they were all leaning up against the wall on the other side and they were receiving the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. God will do the miraculous if we'll do what we can do. And take his spirit and his anointing. Praise God. Praise God. If you believe the Lord wants to use you here tonight, I'm going to ask you to come and join me. Praise God. If you believe that the Lord wants to work in your life and take his anointing and allow it to flow through you. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 We have power and authority in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. The anointing of God's Spirit is upon us tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a wonderful group of people here. You know what? The devil is scared. The devil's scared watching all of you come up here. We, we don't have to be afraid of him. He has to be afraid of us. The Bible said one shall put a thousand to flight. And two will not put two thousand but ten thousand to flight. It will begin to multiply. And I don't know how many are up here. But can you imagine what the Lord is going to do through this group of people? Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. What I'm going to do is pray a prayer, if you don't mind, brother, okay, they're already praying. That's what I was going to get you to do. But I'm going to pray a prayer, releasing God's anointing upon each one of you. And I want you, if you feel impressed to pray for somebody, to go and start praying for them in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Lord Jesus, right now we're releasing your anointing upon this gathering of people. They have come here, Lord, with the expectation that you're going to work through them with your anointing. And so we release that anointing in the powerful name of Jesus. Begin to work the miraculous through them, Lord. Allow your spirit to flow freely. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you feel if impressed to pray somebody, you know that they're sick. Why don't you go and pray for them right now? Believe God. When your hand touches them, they can be healed in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God has given you authority. He's given you power. And so he said, go and take this authority and power. Begin to use it. Don't 
let it remain dormant in your heart. But use it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Let's believe God right now. Let's pray together. Praise God. Praise God. Begin to seek the Lord. Oh, praise you, Jesus.
Hallelujah. I just got a, a praise report from, from Brother Ethan from the Luther Center. There's a lady there that had a cyst on her back. And Ethan and a couple of young guys that were preaching there that night, they said, well, we're just going to pray and believe that God's going to heal you and touch your body. They were going to take this cyst off, and they said she wouldn't be able to walk for a long time. She wouldn't be able to walk for several weeks and would be in a lot of pain. Well, they prayed in Jesus' name. And she called Ethan the day after the surgery and said, the doctors don't believe it. I am up and walking and I have no pain in my body and in my back. Jesus Christ healed me. (laughs) We're praying for your wife. We're believing that God is going to heal her in the name of Jesus. We pray against infection in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're believing, Brother Allen, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Full and complete healing in Jesus' name. We've seen signs. Amen. We're believing for each and every one of you in this room. Amen. Thank you so much, brother and sister Shalm. Wow. Did you enjoy the ministry of missionary Shalm? Thank you so much. It is truly our honor to have you all here. If you can help them, help them out with their airfare if you can. Um, I know they would appreciate that. Also, the book, uh, if you want to buy that book, please buy it. I'm going to buy it, and we're going to read it as a family. So we, we've been reading Bishop Bernard's, David Bernard's missionary book. We're almost done with it. We've read uh, Benny DeMerchant's two missionary books that were written for him, and we're going to read your book next. And uh, I, I'm telling you, if you don't have any of those, get all of them, because they will bless you and your family. They, they will bless you. God bless you tonight is our prayer. Good to see you. Pastor Aldo, I saw him in here. Firstborn Ministerios Espanol, God bless you. So glad Pastor Aldo is with us here tonight. We will see you Wednesday night. God bless you all. Pray as long as you would like.